Again, by looking at Peter. I like to study Peter. I made quite a, I've got notes in here about Peter's life and when Peter was a strong and fervent believer and when his attention or his thinking was diverted to his own desires and his faith. And Jesus had to pray that his faith not fail after three years of Peter being a fervent believer. But we haven't time for Peter and Paul right now. This is a study. Look at these passages. Get your Bible ready if you want to, or listen carefully as I give you some. To find some kinds of answers to these above questions about how faith connects with Christ and with God's grace. I don't have any particular reason for this order, but they're in this order. Hebrews 3 is warning again and again. It leads on into other passages, Hebrews, but 3.12. Take heed, brethren, lest perchance there shall be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief, falling away from the living God. But exhort one another day by day, as long as it is called today, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, faith, Amen. firm unto the end. Amen. While it is said, today if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Then he talks about those Israelites who had good tidings preached also to them, but it didn't profit them because not united by faith with him who made the promises. And the 19th verse, so we see they were not able to enter in because of unbelief. Amen. The fourth chapter, the 11th verse, let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest that no man fail after the same example of disobedience, which was basically unbelief. Um, you know the, the rest of it there, or you have it before you through 16. But at 14, he urges us, having a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Yes. Confession is our conviction of what we believe, our yes. witness. Amen. For we have not a high priest who is unable to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he has been in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with boldness. That's another expression of our faith. With a ready and firm faith. Unto the throne of grace. Yes. That we may receive mercy. And may find grace to help in time of need. In Hebrews 10. 37 to 39. <clears throat> I begin at 35. Cast not away therefore your boldness which hath great recompense and reward, for you have need of patience, that's endurance, steadfastness, <clears throat> that having done the will of God, you may receive the promise, thing promised. For yet a very little while, and he that cometh shall come, and shall not tarry. But my righteous one shall live by faith. Yes, if he shrink back, my soul hath no pleasure in him. When the Lord appears, don't be afraid. But we are not of them that shrink back unto perdition, perishing, but of them that have faith under the saving of the soul. So he gives this whole 11th chapter, by faith, Enoch did not die, by faith, Noah being warned of God, was moved with godly fear and prepared the ark and became an heir of the righteousness, which is by faith, Amen. among other things you've mentioned. And Abraham and Moses, by faith, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing, counting ill treatment with the people of God, greater riches than all the treasures of Egypt. Amen. The reproach of Christ, it is called also. What did Moses know about Christ? All these examples of faith, so it leads to the 12th chapter. Therefore, with all these witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us, and run with endurance the race set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. And in the 12th chapter also, there are verses 29 to 25 to 29. <clears throat> now let's just take 28 and 29. Wherefore, receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have grace. <laughs> this is probably where the word charis is used for gratitude. Let us have gratitude. 
There's no way we can show unmerited favor to God except to give of our hearts that which we have to give our gratitude. And actually, uh, Boyce knows some Spanish. He can tell you gracia means both grace and thanks. And in Greek, charis means thanks. In fact, it's even used as an improper preposition. Thanks to this, due to this, on account of this. Karen Tutu. Having a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us have gratitude, whereby we may offer service well-pleasing unto God with reverence and awe, for our God is consuming fire. Why didn't he say, let us have faith? Why did he say, let us have grace? Oh, many of you will think, well, it means receive grace from God. I don't think that's what he's thinking about here. In John 14, 6, you remember, um, we don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 22. The 16th verse is an exhortation to us all. It should sound familiar. Now watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. The 22nd verse is a shocker. But if any man love not the Lord, talking about Jesus Christ, let him go to hell, there's nothing else you can do about it. Is yours translated that way? It says, let him be anathema, because nobody wants to translate the Greek and make it plain to you, if any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to hell. And you can grieve about it, but you can't do anything else about it. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. 1 Peter 1, 5. Guarded by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Look at Revelation 21, 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving. And then a list of those we think are terrible sinners have their part in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. But it begins with the fearful and the unbelieving. Yes. Amen. Why would that be at the head of the list of the sins that cause people to partake of the fire, of the lake of fire? 1 John 5, 1. He that believeth is born of God. And whether you translate it as some do, begotten of God or born of God, all comes out to mean the same thing. Ganao refers to birth. When it's talking about the father, it's begetting. When it's talking about the mother, it's bringing forth. But uh, it's the verb used here. He's begotten of God. He's born of God. And whoever loves the one that is the offspring of, of God, or loves, loves the father, loves the children. Amen. So what he's saying in the fifth verse, who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Uh, the latter part of the fourth verse. This is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. And 10 to 13. I've been a little surprised I haven't heard this one cited and read here today. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness of God in him. Amen. He that believes not God makes out God to be a liar. Because he has not believed in the witness that God has borne concerning his own son. The witness is this, that God gave unto us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that has the son has the life. He that has not the son of God has not the life. It's just that simple. John says, and I write this to you so that you may know that you have eternal life. If you can know you have Christ. Do you know you have a wife? Do you know you have a boss? Do you know you have a... School, do you know you have an appointment? Do you know you have a, a partner in business? Yes. Well, then how about knowing Christ as our boss and our teacher and our partner uh, and companion for life? If you don't know that you have the Son of God, you better find out today. That's right. Amen. 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 Did God ever give his grace without doing it through faith? Now, the word grace may be too broad here. That's a hard question to answer. It'll take a very thorough research, and then we won't know all about God. 
But I mean, did God grant forgiveness always with a provision that it be received by some expression of faith? For example, put the blood on the doorpost and the death angel pass over you. Go forward through the Red Sea. Come and look upon the brass snake. Make the designated sacrifices for sin. Naaman, dip in the Jordan. God can do the deliverance that his grace wants to provide. Why does he put these stumbling blocks in the way? He, why does he challenge us to believe him? But what about the lame man at the pool of Bethesda? Jesus walks up to a man, 38 years in his infirmity, and said, Do you want to be made well? And said, Foolish questions. <laughs> and Jesus just made him well in spite of his reluctance. No, he wasn't really reluctant to be made well. And Jesus told him, you get up and take up that bed and carry it. And that was the Sabbath day of Passover week in the city of Jerusalem, enough to get the man killed. But the man got up, picked up his bed, carried it, and he got arrested for it. They asked him, why are you doing this? He said, the man who made me able to walk told me to, wouldn't you? Amen. And he told them, then Jesus found him and said, do you believe? And he said, believe on him. Who is he? And Jesus, Jesus, this man didn't know Jesus at all before. Didn't know even at the time. He didn't show any faith when, when Jesus healed him. But he showed his faith afterward after he told Jesus. And the fifth chapter of John is a great chapter to study. Well, what about um, putting the ear back on Malchus? at the gate of the Garden of Gethsemane. I'm, I'm very interested, Dallas, in the Greek there. In this, the, the, I forget to quote the Greek right now, but it, some translate it, enough of that, as if he's saying to Peter, don't whack with that sword anymore. Maybe Jesus is saying to the soldiers that had a hold of, let go and let me go this far. Up to here, he says, and, and uh, I think maybe he's talking to Malchus, by your leave, sir. And he picks up the ear and pastes it back on without Elmer's glue. <laughs> did Malchus believe? He afterward did probably. <laughs> what about the dead son of a widow being carried out of Nain? And Jesus walked up and touched the beard and said, sit up. How much faith did that corpse have before it sat up? And he gave him back to his mother. Did they believe? Now, we get theories. Uh, I remember as a young student puzzling of one classroom, one of the fine learned professors would emphasize that Jesus always required faith, cannot work miracles without finding the faith or stirring up the faith in those to receive it. Another emphasizing in the book of Acts, the third chapter, Peter and John uh, healed that lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, and he had no faith. And I think some students said, these guys ought to get together. Well, the teacher's looking at different cases. And you need to study this and not decide you're going to choose one answer or the other. You're going to find it in the Word. <clears throat> Why did Jesus say to a woman, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace? Now, it was really Jesus who forgave her, your sins are forgiven, he said. On, in response to or in working together with her faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to be well-pleasing unto God. Matthew 13, 58. When he went to Nazareth the second time during his ministry, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, Jesus could work miracles any time he wanted to. He stilled a tempest on the sea without asking it to have faith. And yet he could not do many mighty works in Nazareth because of unbelief. And he said in Jerusalem to the rulers, How often will I have gathered thy children unto me as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings? But ye would not. Here's where... Faith is necessary to meet the grace of God. 
the grace of God was ready and to be uh, willing to be applied to all of them. But they had to be willing. Can God's grace actually be a form of indifference to our sins and to our sinful nature? Can God just decide to forget about our guilt or our pollution? No, he cares about us. And what will become of us in our sin? And it's personal with God. He wants to do things to us, for us, and in us. And he needs to get our attention and our permission and our cooperation. And faith gives those and submission. God is righteous and he's in control of his creation. And he must take care of the problem of sin. And this thought sneaks into my thinking. God feels responsible for the wickedness of this awful creature he made, mankind. And the sin of man is a desperate and terrible challenge to the sovereignty of God and the wisdom of God and the rights of God to rule in his creation. He must take care of sin. Could he take care of the record of our offenses Merely dismiss the charges against us without getting our attention and our consent? Why do so many people think so? Why do theologians think they can decide here what God is doing with all the Muslims or all the Jews or all the Hindus in the world? That's what amazes me. Because people are making a God they want to believe in instead of listening to God who wants them to believe him. Now beware. Trying to understand God must be undertaken with humility. Amen. Take care that we're not being presumptuous, that we're not trying to tell God what he has to be like in order to please us. One of the most terrible things that, that just makes me shudder is when somebody's talking about God and somebody says, that's not the God I believe in. The God I believe in, he's not talking about somebody he believes, he's talking about somebody he manufactures. And to go into a classroom of philosophy or sociology or psychology and manufacture a God is just as idolatrous as to go into the woods and carve one out of an oak stump. Amen. It's pure idolatry. Now should we then not even attempt to explain how the death of Christ brings life to believers or how faith is related to God's grace? Does it help or hinder us simply to dismiss us as a mystery we can't understand? We can be childlike in faith and accept it, but must we all our lives refuse to let God tell us what he wants to tell us in explanation. We can proclaim God's revelation for men to accept, whether they understand why or not, but they will be better able to accept it and rest their whole life purpose upon it, give their whole uh, submission to God. You won't believe it, but... I copied this on the copying machine, and somewhere I, I put the original one, too. Maybe this is it. I made 20 copies, so some of you would, that would want to examine it. And, and, but when it came out, it came out with page 6 on the back of 1. <laughs> Here's what I need. Will people commit their whole heart to it if they can see how it makes sense. Amen. Yes. Amen. Anyway, we should not feel that we can know all of God's purposes or motives, but we should respect every provision or requirement that he makes as having good reasons and necessity fitting his personality and his character and his wisdom and his justice and his goodness. Yes. And this is what I want to say. We should try to understand all the teaching he has given us in his word. Amen. We need to see what he really wants us to do and to be, what he wants to do for us, and we need to be ready and eager to cooperate fully with him. So let's try to make sure that we do really believe him. I recommend this book, Knowing God, by J.I. Packer, especially page 17. I just want you to get a taste of this. We need, before we start, to ascend this mountain to know God, 
We need to stop and ask ourselves, why? The question concerns our own motives and intentions as students. We need to ask ourselves, what's my ultimate aim and object in occupying my mind with these things about knowing God? What do I intend to do with my knowledge about God once I got it? For the fact that we have to face is this. If we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it's bound to go bad on us. It will make us proud and conceited. The very greatness of the subject matter will intoxicate us. We'll come to think of ourselves as a cut above other Christians because of our interest in it and our grasp of it. And we'll look down on those whose theological ideas seem to us crude and inadequate and dismiss them as poor specimens. But as Paul told the conceited Corinthians, knowledge puffs up, it's love that builds up. If any man thinks he knows anything, he knows not yet as he ought to know. Amen. To be preoccupied with getting theological knowledge as an end in itself, to approach Bible study with no higher motive than to desire to know all the answers, is the direct route to a state of self-satisfied self-deception. Now look, we can't leave out Christ and the cross. God's grace is offered to us only in Christ. Amen. Only in Christ. Amen. I have a bunch of texts here, but it seems I shouldn't take time to do those over. We've heard Acts 4.12, no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. We quoted John 14.6, no one comes to the Father but by me. There is one God and one mediator between man and God himself, man, even Jesus Christ. There is no God but the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no Christ but the Christ of the cross. Amen. The one who suffered under Pontius Pilate, who rose from the dead, who ascended on high to reign until he have come again to receive his own unto himself. Christianity is personal. We aren't dealing here with ideas with the personal God of grace and our personal response of faith. Amen. Remember Ernest Beam, who in the 40s and 50s edited the Christian Forum and campaigned for unity and fellowship of members of the Lord's body, the church? At Tulsa in the North American Convention of 1952, he and I preached on the same session. He preached a great message on the essentials of New Testament Christianity, the Christ, the cross, and the new creature. These three are all necessary because God is who he is. He's the righteous one who loves us. He cannot deny or disregard the guilt of our sin. He cannot remove the penalty of sin without a sufficient reason or basis, one that fulfills the law of God and satisfies its purpose. Amen. Christ's death offers to God a fulfillment of the law's demands for sinners to die. Amen. At the same time, Christ's personal love dying for us produces a change in the heart of sinners through faith and love, a change that cures rebellion and brings acceptance of God's rule. Amen. Christ's death offers to us a way for us to accept the sentence of death. Now this is what we're very reluctant to do, and usually won't do. We won't accept the sentence of death. That because we have sinned, we don't deserve to live anymore, but if we'll accept the death of Christ as our death, we can accept the gift he gives us of his life, and we can live his life through faith instead of our life in self-will. We cannot be accepted by God in our sin, but we can be accepted by God in Christ, who already suffered the penalty of our sins. <clears throat> now study 2 Corinthians 5, 14 to 6, 1. The love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that one died for all, therefore all died. He died for all that they that live should live no longer unto themselves, but unto him who for their sakes died and rose again. Therefore, we don't see anyone from the human point of view anymore. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. They've all become new. God brought reconciliation through Christ's death on the cross and through our faith in the death of Christ. Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree, 1 Peter 2, 24. 
His death removed the penalty for sin, settled the charge God had against the sinner. His love and his grace also reconciled the sinner to God, removes the distrust and the hatred that sinners have for God. The old past is settled, and the guilt removed, and a new relationship with God is begun. A new life is established. There are some ways we can point out in which grace or faith works together with God's grace. Our faith makes us alive unto God, raised up with Christ. Amen. Our faith in Christ, listen, accepts his intercession for us, accepts his atoning death for us, accepts his loving rule. That's also grace of God. Amen. For our redeemed lives, it brings new birth, receives Christ's spirit to live in us, our faith permits God to lead us without forcing us, Amen. lets us enter in, lets him enter into our thoughts and feelings to make us new creatures. Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. Amen. And we won't believe Christ enough to open our hearts and let him live in and take over and make over to make new creatures. Then we are just refusing to trust the grace of God. Faith in Christ or faith in the gospel message is not to be seen as a condition of God's being willing to save us. God would save everybody. That's his will. God loves unconditionally, but he cannot make his love effective without the condition of our response, of our participation, our receptivity. Our faith in Christ is not a condition, but a channel. I'm glad Brother Key used this phrase, this word. A channel through which God is able to make effective, take effective action and make us his forgiven and regenerated children. Through faith he leads us to be reconciled, to be repentant, to be regenerated, that is born anew by the working of his spirit and our spirits, both to will and to work, Philippians 2.13. It is God who works in you both the willing and the working to be new and different and obedient and quit being a mere human being. Amen. God not only wants to change our record from guilt to pardon, he wants to change us. He saves us from death, the penalty of sin, but he also wants to save us from sin and make, us, make sin have no longer dominion over us. The good news is God is ready and eager. He is able and active to save us from the penalty of sin, perishing, from the power of sin, polluting and distorting our character from the, pre, the propensity, our preference for sin, the self-will that has an innate bias or bent towards serving ourselves instead of God, and from the presence of sin, finally, these promises transform our nature if we believe them. Amen. Yes. So that we shall not only be translated into his kingdom, we shall be transformed into his likeness, and we shall be transported into his presence Amen. to share eternity in his glory, in his wisdom, in his blessedness, and eternities a long time. Amen. The joys and the glory of our wonderful Lord are ours, and he's preparing us for it. Amen. We'd better believe it. Amen. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we shall be like him, for we shall see him even as he is. And everyone has this hope set on him, purifies himself even as he is pure. Amen. Faith is the essence of the way we act and react. Faith is not a mere possession of a passive state or a former state of mind, which we once acquired by some academic or catechetical process. Amen. It is not only doctrinal, it is personal. It's not something in our past, but it must be a present reality in our hearts. It's not what you once accepted as true, but what you now feel as the controlling interest of your life. Yes. Amen. We cannot keep faith in a freezer or in a notebook. Amen. Amen. There is surely a real connection between being saved by the death of Christ through faith, Romans 3, 24 to 26. God made him to be the propitiation for our sins to receive, be received by faith and to be effective through his blood. Now it's not faith in the blood, but by means of his blood to be received by faith. To show God's righteousness in passing over sins done aforetime in the forbearance of God when it looked like God was a dirty crook joining with the crooks. 
Because the death of Christ is the only thing that justifies God for being merciful to David. And then for the showing of his righteousness at this present time, that he might be the justifier of them that have faith in Jesus. That's what that's all about. That's the doctrine of the cross is wonderful to preach. Amen. Amen. There must be a connection between that and the ninth chapter, which says, we cannot be saved if we don't have the Spirit of Christ. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Why is our faith involved? Because... Our hearts must be made over. Our God must get inside of us. He must have our consent and our attention and our appreciation and our cooperation in a personal way. Amen. What is faith doing? Well, Paul preached unto obedience of faith among all the nations. He began Romans with that. He ended Romans with that. And he deals with that all the way through, and it takes a great education to be blind enough not to see it. <clears throat> Amen. Obedience of faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith working through love. Mm -hmm. Believing means acting on what we trust and what we care about. I had a friend listening attentively to my preaching regularly and studying his Bible, and he came not only to see the truth of the message, but to realize that it had not been ruling in his life. In the night, he slipped out of bed and went out into the kitchen and got out on the floor and prayed, Lord, I know it's true. Help me to believe it. Now, do you realize what that prayer is? There are many Sunday school lessons you may believe are true, but did you ever live by faith in them? God answered that prayer. Amen. I can't tell you the interesting story of the rest of his life. Don Whitman was there. I think Ray Downer was there maybe when I preached his funeral over at the Blenville Church. But the key to his life was the prayer on the kitchen floor. I know it's true. Help me to believe it. Now what's the difference between knowing it's true and believing it? Being personally committed knowing I want to follow this. Amen. Yes. Amen. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says of Christ, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered, and being made perfect, he became of all them that obey him, the author of eternal salvation. Them that obey him. Faith in Christ is not a passive consent to some doctrine, but it's an active surrender to a certain person. It's yielding ourselves to him so that we are grafted onto him 